Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Tarantula Bait by Paul Chadwick A shriek, throaty and horrible, shattered the stillness of Hamilton Square. Night shadows lay like pools of ink on the serpentine asphalt's walk. The dusty, heavy midsummer foliage swayed lazily in the breeze, making faint, eerie whisperings. Then the shriek came again, followed by another and another. Heads appeared in windows of a half-dozen nearby apartment houses. Radios were quickly snapped off. Men and women looked fearfully at each other, then gazed down into the square, where the darkness made everything indistinct. The cop on the beat, running parallel with the square, heard the shrieks, too. He whirled and dashed forward, vaulting over the low iron fence onto the grass, his nightstick clutched in his hand. Swift footsteps sounded ahead of him. Then a figure burst from the end of one of the walks. It was a girl, running till her breath came in labored, sobbing gas. Her face had the deathly whiteness of parchment. Her eyes were wide and staring. Strands of loosened hair whipped behind her, and a gleaming white shoulder showed where one side of her dress had been torn away. Her steps quickened when she saw the policeman. With a last burst of energy that made her high heels click over the asphalt, she ran toward him and collapsed at his feet, moaning hysterically. Then words came from her lips. "'I saw him,' she gasped. "'The tarantula. He's back there, in the square. Don't let him get me, please.' The cop bent down, but the girl had wilted suddenly, falling into a dead faint. Figures began to slip out of doorways and move towards the spot. A small crowd was gathering. They pressed around the unconscious girl, turning to stare uneasily into the shadows of the square. The cop growled at them. Stand back. Give her some air. He stooped, gathered the girl in his arms, and carried her into the lobby of the nearest apartment. Then he called headquarters, his voice hoarse and low. Five minutes later, the French-type telephone in Wade Hammond's bachelor apartment jangled. Wade picked the instrument up. His gaunt, bronze face, with its pencil-thin mustache line tightened, as he heard the excited voice of the desk sergeant at the other end. It's the tarantula again, Hammond. The boys are on their way now. The square's only a few blocks from your place. Better run over and take a look. Something funny is up. Wade replaced the instrument in its bed and slipped out of his tasseled lounging robe. Funny was no name for it. The first tarantula scare had startled the city a few nights before. A man crossing Hamilton Square claimed that he'd seen a great, black, eight-legged creature moving over the grass, moving like the spirit of death itself. The thing, he said, was seven feet in diameter, and for want of a better name he called it a tarantula. It was too fantastic to be believed, but it made good newspaper copy. The tabloids had played it up. Now the tarantula had been seen by a girl. Wade smiled grimly as he got into his coat. He was too hard-headed to take stock in such a thing. He wondered what new kind of a racket someone was trying to put over. Men from the tenth precinct were beating through the shrubbery of the square when he arrived. Their flashlights gleamed everywhere. They had almost finished their search, and nothing had been found. A burly detective from Wade knew approached and spoke. "'She must have been cuckoo,' he said. "'There ain't nothing here, no tracks, even. Better go in and talk to her, Hammond. The sergeant's there now.' Wade took the advice. He found the girl in the leather lounge in the apartment lobby. A janitress had put a screen in front of her so that curious people in the street couldn't stare in. A sergeant of detectives was bending over her, getting ready to shoot questions, and the girl was just coming to. Wade moved close and nodded at the sergeant, whose name was Tarrant. The girl's eyelashes were heavily mascarad. Her lips were vivid crimson against the white oval of her face, but when she opened her eyes there was something wistful and appealing about her. She sat up and clutched at her torn dress. "'Don't mind us,' said the sergeant. Just tell us what you saw out there. The tarantula, she whispered. I saw its hairy legs and its horrible red eyes. It grabbed at me with its claws. It was the most terrible thing I've ever seen, like a nightmare. The girl shivered and half closed her eyes as though to blot out the memory. It must have been a nightmare, said the sergeant pointedly. 
What's your name, miss? Faith Tashman. Please take me to the apartment next door, where my friends are. The sergeant nodded. Cops held the curious crowd back while he and Wade escorted the girl along the sidewalk and into the next building. As soon as they got inside, Wade verified what he had already guessed. The girl was an actress. A couple of the other young women crowded around her, asking questions and trying to comfort her. One was a platinum blonde, the other a redhead. Wade could tell by their speech and ultra-sophisticated dress they were stage people. "'Faith and I were in the same troop before the depression hit,' said the platinum blonde. Wade smiled. He wondered what Faith Tashman's real name was. The combination sounded too stagey to be genuine. They ascended to the girls' rooms, and from glimpses he got through half-open doors, Wade judged that the place was a hangout for down-on-their-luck bohemians. The building was shabby and run down, contrasting sharply with the expensive apartments on the south side of the square. The platinum blonde spoke again. "'I'll make Faith lie down,' she said. "'The poor kid's got the jitters.' Wade watched Miss Tashman being led away. He saw her pale face and the look of terror that still lingered in her eyes. Whatever had caused it, her shock was real enough. The sergeant began talking to the redhead. "'You people who live here must be hitting the booze to see things like that,' he said. "'It'll be snakes next.' He laughed, jawling the red-headed girl along, till the platinum blonde made her appearance again. She came out, closed the door quietly behind her, and put her fingers to her lips. "'I gave Faith a snifter,' she said. "'She's going to take a little nap. She was on her way to a party at Jack Winchell's across the square, but I don't believe she'll make it now.' "'Well, we'll be going,' said Tarrant. "'Don't let this tarantula business frighten you, kids.' It's a lot of baloney. Some nut is. He suddenly stopped speaking and leaned forward. A sound echoed through the apartment. The faces of the two girls went white as death. It was another shriek, a shriek of terror. It came from the door through which Faith Tashman had walked a few minutes before. From the room where she was supposedly lying, resting after her scare, the scream ended in a choking, inarticulate cry. Wade Hammond leaped to the door and threw it wide. The chamber was brightly lighted. There was a small bed with rumpled covering. The window was wide open, and Faith Tashman was gone. The sergeant was close behind him as he thrust his head over the window sill. Look, there she is. Wade's eyes widened with horror as he glimpsed the crumpled form on the sidewalk three stories below. The girl lay there, pitifully sprawled out, and Wade knew that she must be dead. She jumped, said the sergeant hoarsely. She got so scared, she bumped herself off. She shouldn't have been left alone. Wayne turned away from the window. "'Where does that door lead?' he asked, pointing across the room. Then, without waiting for an answer, he strode forward and flung the door open. He found himself in the corridor again. Just as he stepped out, another door down the hall opened. He looked into the eyes of a tall, somber-faced man, a man with thin lips, a hawkish nose, and features that held a bizarre mixture of power and cruelty. Wade had the feeling that the man had started to step back, then showed himself when he realized he'd been seen. The two girls were coming out into the hall, too. The redhead was sobbing hysterically, but the platinum blonde was still calm. "'It's only Marco,' she said, seeing the intent look on Wade's face as he stared at the man down the hall. "'Marco?' Wade's face was questioning. "'Yes, Marco Durer, the magician, a swell guy. I did a disappearing bathing beauty act with him at the New Century last winter.' Wade nodded and went on down the hall. His eyes rested on the tall man speculatively. The magician came forward as he reached the stairway. "'What's the trouble?' he asked softly. "'Miss Tashman saw the tarantula,' said Wade. "'Now she's fallen out of her window and is down in the street, dead.' He looked sharply at Marco Durer and saw the muscles in the man's leathery face go taut. "'Dead?' The word came like a gasp. "'She must be,' Wade said. "'It's three stories to the sidewalk.' He turned and ran down the stairs. Sergeant Tarant was beside him, when he reached the huddled body in the pavement. A policeman, the same one who had helped her out of the square, was bending over her. She's finished this time, he said soberly. The scare must have got her in the head. Made her jump. Wade bent down and stared at the face of the dead girl. He reached forward and brushed a strand of loose hair away from her neck. Then he gave a stifled exclamation. My God, look! The other saw what he was staring at. Sergeant Tarrant began cursing hoarsely. On the girl's white neck, close to her throat, were two terrible wounds. Crimson holes her gigantic fans seemed to have penetrated. She would have died even if she hadn't fallen, said Wade. This is murder, Tarrant. The Tarantula has claimed his victim. Better question everybody in the house. But how did he get to her room? 
Some guy's doing this, but who? And why? You've got me, Tarrant. I feel as I've had a shot too many myself. Miss Tashman was three stories up. She was alone only two minutes or so. But there was that door leading into the corridor. Brakes shrilled as an expensive sports roaster roared around the side of the square and drew up at the curb. The door opened and an excited man stepped out. What's this I hear? What's happened to Faith? The man came forward, then recoiled in sudden horror as he saw the figure on the sidewalk. His finely chiseled but dissipated face went ashen. Wade turned and stared at the newcomer. It's Jack Winchell, Jr., whispered the cop. Lives across the square and spends his old man's dough on radio and high-stepping dames. Wade remembered then. A few weeks back, he had read about Winchell's amateur radio station on the roof of his apartment, the station where he experimented in a haphazard way. The slender antennae mast of his transmission set, duly licensed by the radio board, thrust steel fingers upward into the sky above Hamilton Square. So this was Winchell, heir to the Winchell millions, dilettantes, inventor, and experts ladies' man. Wade looked at him closely. The thing was getting complicated. Marco, the magician, and Winchell. They both seemed strangely interested in the dead girl. What happened? Winchell repeated, his voice shrill with fear. She saw the tarantula, said Wade. She's been murdered. Look at her throat. Young Winchell did so, and the color left his face. He said, We were having a party at my place. Most of the stage people who live here, and a lot of others, we were expecting Miss Tashman. I phoned, and the janitress told me there'd been an accident. As though to prove his words, some of his guests, who had hurried around the square after him, came up. Wade recognized a few. There was Lucille Roberts, the blues singer, Bert Thelmo, Vaudeville Clown, Bowers and Bender, the trapeze team, and Manrique, the contortionist who had played six years on the Keith circuit. They pressed in, staring curiously. The strident clanging of an ambulance sounded, and the crowd parted to let the white-clad attendants reach the girl. But Wade wasn't interested. He knew, without being told, that Faith Tashman was dead, beyond human aid. He was looking at the faces around him, trying to read the subtle emotions him behind the masks of fear. Bert Thelmo's expression was, as always, faintly idiotic, his lips twisted by years of professional grimacing. Manrique was a thin, emaciated man. The trapeze artists were contrasting types. Bowers powerful and stolid, Bender thin and weakly. Then Wade raised his eyes and stared again into the face of Marco Durer. The man had followed them down into the street. He stood there, aloof, brooding, staring at the dead girl with an inscrutable look. But Wade sensed some deep emotion behind his unfathomable expression. He was glad when he saw Sergeant Tarrant questioning the man closely. Durer would bear watching, though the police would be up against a blank wall when it came to connecting the tarantula scare down in the square with the murder of Miss Tashman. Wade listened while the police inquiry went on. Then the ambulance sports pitiful burden away and the crowd began to thin. Jack Winchell did not offer to take his guest back to his apartment. He drove off looking down and shaken. The guest wandered away as though shunning the murder house. Wade slipped into the square feeling that in its eerie shadow lay the solution of the ghastly mystery. He found the bench partially hidden by shrubbery, yet giving him a view of the building where Miss Tashman had met her terrible end. It was getting on towards eleven when he suddenly leaned forward, staring up at the roof of the building across the way. A faint flicker of light showed for a moment, then winked off. It came again as he stared. Someone was up there, but who? He slipped out of the shadows of the square, crossed the street, and entered the building next to the one where Miss Tashman had been killed. He showed his special investigator's card bearing the signature of the police commissioner himself, then climbed to the top floor. Cautiously, he opened the door leading to the roof and stepped out. He crouched and crept forward. A low brick wall separated the roof of the building he was on from the next one. He stared over it and saw the light again. Someone with a small flash in his hands was moving over the roofs along the edge of the square. Wade followed silently, then stopped as the flashlight ceased its flickering and a dim form loomed ahead. He moved to the rear of the roof and crouched down, feeling a prickle of excitement along his spine. Then he drew in his breath sharply. A figure came opposite and was silhouetted for an instant against the glow coming up from the street. It was Marco Durer, the magician prowling along the dark roof, and his right hand was deep in his right coat pocket. What was he up to? Did he suspect someone, or had he some more sinister reason for being there? Wade remembered the door leading into the corridor from Miss Tashman's room, and the strange look on Marco Durer's face 
as he had come out. He saw Durer quicken his pace and disappear through a skylight door in the building where he lived. Wade at once left the roof, went down into the street again, and strolled back into the square. His eyes were alert now, his attitude tense. In a moment he saw Durer come out. The man lighted a cigarette, tossed the match away, then crossed the street and entered the square also, following one of the asphalt paths. Wade eased into the shadows near his bench till Durer had passed. Then he came out and followed, sticking to the grass plots beside the path, moving silently as a shadow. The magician walked with an air of determination, heading straight across the square towards the south side, where the more expensive apartments were situated, where Winchell had his place. He reached the exact center of the square and stepped into a little open space where a small fountain played. A thick branched maple made mottled shadows close to the fountain. For a moment, Durer's form blended with these. Then he emerged again, but Wade bent forward, every muscle taut, hardly believing his eyes. The shadow behind Durer seemed to spread, seemed to enlarge and creep forward. Then there came a hideous choking cry. Wade saw Durer go down on his face, saw the thing that had seemed a shadow leap upon him, saw a horrible black something lift up and reach down for Durer's throat. For a moment the body of the magician was blotted out by the darker thing crouching on his back. Wade sprang forward, breath hissing through clenched teeth, his hand reaching for the gun in his armpit holster. The shadow on Durer's back twisted for an instant. Wade got a second's glimpse of two red eyes, baleful and devilish in their inhuman intensity. Then he saw the horrible black hairy legs, and he knew he was looking at the tarantula, knew he had seen it strike another victim down. He raised his automatic to fire, but the black ghastly shadow was gone. It had disappeared as mysteriously as it had come, seeming to blend with and vanish into the larger shadows of the trees. All that was left to prove it had been there was Marco Durer's sprawled form. Wade fired two shots as a signal to the detectives patrolling the edges of the square. Then he went up to Durer. The first glimmer of his flashlight showed the telltale throat wounds. A stream of crimson was running from them, glistening and spreading on the asphalt. The tarantula had struck for Durer's jugular veins. Even in that moment of horror, Wade's lips curled in a faint, grim smile. He was smiling at himself, at his own false hunch, which had made him suspect Durer as the murderer. Now the mystery of the tarantula seemed more impenetrable than ever. But suddenly he bent forward, eyes narrowing. On the asphalt beside Durer's head and shoulders was a faint streak of whitish powder. It was fresh, lying on the very surface of the walk. Wade set his flashlight beside it, then with delicate care scraped the powder onto a piece of paper which he took from his pocket. He had just finished a job when the first detective arrived. He told his story then, told it briefly, and felt almost like a suspect himself, so fantastic were the details of the killing. Which way did the tarantula go? asked the detective. Wade shrugged. I couldn't tell. One moment I saw it against the asphalt, the next it was gone. It's a hell of a note, said the dick. Two murders in one night on the same case? The inspector himself will want to look into this. By daylight, with Inspector Thompson at his side, Wade went over the square again. The grizzled head of the City Homicide Bureau, who at first had taken the tarantula case as a joke, was now deeply troubled. Any theories, Hammond? Not yet, Chief. None worth mentioning. Let's go call on Jack Winchell. His radio apparatus interests me. Are we studying radio or making a murder investigation? Both. Wade spoke quietly. He didn't tell Thompson about the white powder. He wasn't sure how it fitted in himself, and it was his habit not to give voice to a theory till he had some facts to bolster it. The powder puzzled him. He had it analyzed, established the fact that it was magnesia, but the idea that it suggested seemed too far-fetched to be real. He had nothing to back it up, no subsidiary theories to prop the main one. He stared up at the high slender mask of Winchell's radio station as they crossed the square. But Winchell was out, and the servant couldn't tell him when he would get back. Thompson seemed dissatisfied, but there was a gleam in Wade Hamden's eyes. That afternoon he rented a room on the south side of the square, in the only rooming house left in a row of high-class apartments. It overlooked the square, and from his windows he could see the shadows of the Winchell radio mask on the grass plots below. The shadows lengthened as evening came, seeming to stretch over the square like long and sinister fingers. Then they dimmed as the sky darkened. Wade went for a stroll in the square, every sense alert. He crossed it and met a party of stage people from the murder house on their way to dinner. 
Manrique, Lucille Roberts, Thelmo the Clown, Bowers and Bender, and the two girls, who had been near Miss Tasman's room, were in the party. The platinum blonde greeted him. "'We're all going to move out at the end of the week,' she said. "'It gives me the heebie-jeebies to think of what happened to Marco and Faith. The rest feel the same way. And I've just taken a room across the square,' said Wade. "'The second floor, front of the brownstone house. I'll be near by then if anything else breaks.' The blonde shuddered. "'Let's hope it doesn't. I didn't sleep a wink last night, and I won't tonight, either.' Wade nodded. He didn't expect to get much sleep himself, but he had undertaken the job voluntarily. Crime riddles fascinated him, and he'd never run across one which seemed more mystifying than this on the surface. It was another warm night. He left the window of his room wide open and turned the light out. He had a deeper reason than merely wanting to watch the square in taking a place so close to the scene of the murders. If certain theories of his were correct, he knew he was playing a dangerous game. The evening deepened and a deathly quiet settled over the square. People shunned it now. Everyone in the city had read the ghastly story. They even avoided its vicinity as much as possible. Alert Wade waited in his room, waited for something he was not sure about himself. The hours passed, midnight came, and still the tomb-like quiet of the square had not been broken. He found himself getting drowsy. He, too, had been up a greater part of the night before. He sat down in a chair for a few moments to rest his leg, facing the window, his gun near his hand. Another hour ticked by. It was rearing work, this waiting for something that might never come. Before he knew it, his head had fallen forward and his eyelids closed. Then a sound awakened him, a sound that seemed nothing more at first than a faint mouse-like scratching. But his eyelids opened, his head lifted up, and if he hadn't been a man with nerves and muscles under supreme control, he would have cried out, shrieked aloud in the wave of stark horror that gripped him. The square of the window, dimly illuminated by the street lights below, was now blotted out. In it was a huge, vague form, a black something with hairy legs entering the room. He found himself staring at two red eyes set in a black, indistinct head. Then the thing came into the room and lunged towards him. A sense of loathing mingled with the horror he felt, as though at a presence unspeakably evil. Against the window now he saw a black claw with gleaming points at the end reach upward and outward toward him. He hurled himself sidewise in the chair, dropped noiselessly to the floor, and reached for his gun at the same moment. The thing seemed to hear him. Wade heard a scraping movement across the floor, saw the black bulk leap backwards toward the window. He fired just as the light was again blotted out as it went through, but the indistinct bulk made a poor target. Yet it seemed to him that his bullet must have struck home, that the killer must have fallen. He leaped to the window half expecting to see it lying on the street as he had seen the body of Faith Tajman. But it was not there, and the night was empty, except for a strange whisper of sound that seemed to fill the air coming from everywhere at once as the surface of the buildings reflected it. The uncanny whisper died away as Wade listened. It died, and he heard only the running feet of the detectives coming at the sound of his shot. Wade ran to the door of his room. That strange whispering sound, the powdered magnesia, the two things set his brain working, gave shape and substance to the theory his mind had been evolving. His eyes were alight now with the zest of the hunt. He went out into the hallway, but instead of descending to the streets to meet the detectives and tell them what had happened, he turned and ran up the stairs to the roof. He opened the skylight and crept out into the night. Like a wraith, he stole across the roof towards the higher bulk of the building where Jack Winchell had his apartment. A fire escape, not visible from the street, snaked up the side of this. There was one landing at the rear, which could be reached from the roof Wade was on. He climbed the iron ladders, passing window after window. There were no lights in Winchell's apartment. He was more cautious than ever as he went up the last slender ladder to the roof. The mast and aerials of the experimental radio station showed. Wade stopped and listened. A faint noise came, so faint that if his ears had not been alert for it, he would not have detected it. It was a scrape of metal on metal, the soft clicking of well-oiled cogs, and high above him a shadow was moving. Like the boom of a derrick, one of the steel radio masts was lifting upwards, lifting from an inclined position which had brought its top over the center of the small square. Wade stole forward toward its base. His gun was out now, his fingers clenched over the hard rubber, but like the talons of a hawk. He crouched, went forward on hands and knees, and suddenly leaped. A cry of terror broke the stillness of the night as he jabbed his gun forward, jabbed it against the man, 
was bending over the handle of a gearbox from which cables led upward to the mast. Sweat streamed from the man's face. Drop it, said Wade tensely. Drop it before I shoot. The man's face went white. I had to do it. He made me. He would have murdered me. Like a cringing cur, the man grappled at Wade's feet. Get over there and stand still. Make any move and I'll kill you. Wade pocketed his gun and took hold of the crank handle. The derrick-like boom of the mast, which had a ball and socket base, was almost vertical with the roof now. A few more turns of the crank and the steel cable leading through a pulley in the top of a still higher mast had drawn it up. It could be lowered and turned to alter the length and direction of the antenna. Another cable led from the mast end, a slender, almost invisible wire, and from this something was dangling, swinging. The black shadow came in towards the end of the roof and landed as a slender wire unwound on a steel reel. A metal fastener was snapped open, and the black shadow bounded toward Wade. This time he fired coolly and accurately, fired and the thing collapsed into a shapeless heap. Wade's flashlight stabbed the darkness, played over the thing on the roof. The shape of the tarantula was visible then, legs sprawling. With a look of disgust, he walked to it. From the heap of cleverly designed cloth and hair, a harsh voice was swearing monotonously, swearing in pain. Wade reached down, tore at the vicious head with its red reflecting lenses, and disclosed the man's face. The face of Bowers, of the trapeze team of Bowers and Bender. Bowers' left hand had a claw-like glove on it, set with two razor-sharp blades at the end, which could be pressed together with his thumb and forefinger. His right hand was uncovered and blackened, but the palm had whitish powder on it. "'You shouldn't have spilled that magnesia,' grated Wade. "'It started me thinking.' I use magnesia myself in my own gym work. Brought it at a drugstore to put on my hands and keep them from slipping. Then I heard the wire whisper when you swung away from the window to trying to kill me. Winchell will be surprised when he learns that you used his radio mask for a purpose he hadn't intended. Sneaked up the fire escape, didn't you? But what was your motive, Bowers? A stream of curses was his only answer. But Bender, the tarantula's white-faced partner, gave the details of the ghastly plot later. He made me help him, he repeated. He was after Winchell's money. Faith Tashman was Bauer's wife, though she didn't live with him. He tried to play the badger game, compromise Winchell, and get a big cash settlement. But Faith got to like Jack and stalled along. Bowers read one of her letters, learned that she wasn't going through with it. That's why he swung up to her room and killed her after failing to get her in the square. Marco de Rear was sweet on Faith and suspicious of Bowers. Bowers guessed he might be wise and killed him for that reason, after seeing prowling around the roofs. He liked a tarantula stunt and was going to work at some. He had it all doped out, and that's why he pulled the first scare in the square. He did a spider act at the Criterion two years ago, climbed up a rope web, and used the same costume. Wade nodded. He had known all along that there was some simple and rational explanation. The deepest-looking puzzles sometimes have the simplest solution. He's got himself mixed up in another web now, he said quietly. The web of the law. And he knows where it will land him.